Um, and I want to encourage you, if you have your Bibles, flip over to Luke chapter 15. Um, we're talking about party and celebration and having a party, right? That's why we played the song, Celebrate Good Times, because we're talking about a party. How many of you like to party? <laughs> Some of you are like, well, it depends on what you mean by that. There's a lot of different kinds of parties. You know, you can have a party for a kindergartner for his birthday, her birthday, and then you could have a frat party. Anybody ever see Animal House? But you don't want to admit it, right? <laughs> Not church. So there's different kinds of parties. You can have a birthday party. You can have a graduation party, right? But there's different kinds of parties, and there's different purposes for a party. How many of you can think of some different purposes? Just shout out some of the purposes. Birthday party? to Anniversary? Shower. Being here is a party. Some people bring the party. Some people are party poopers. <laughs> You're like, whoa. There's a lot of reasons why we celebrate, why we party. But in Luke chapter 15, Jesus talks about a celebration, about partying. And I'm doing a series on the prodigal son. Isabel and I wrote The Road Home, right, on the Good Samaritan. Everybody at Encounter got tired of hearing about the Good Samaritan from Sarah for the last year. Well, now we get to hear about the, good, the prodigal son because Isabel and I are doing a sequel to The Road Home using prodigal son. So you just have to kind of stay tuned for part two, round two. But I want to talk a little bit about prodigal son because in this parable... There are basically three, three parties. You're like, what? Okay, think about the prodigal son. If you remember, the younger son comes to his dad, give me my share of the inheritance. The dad splits it up, gives it to him. The kid runs away uh, to a foreign country and parties away his inheritance, his estate, comes back and says, Dad, I'm not worthy to be your son. Make me a hired hand. Dad, you know, falls on his neck, kisses him, and throws a big party. Right? To celebrate because the son is home. But who's cranky out in the field? The older brother. The older brother. See, you could just get up here. I'm going to give you the mic. <laughs> you could use my notes and probably make it even better. But the older son is in the field, and he comes and hears the dancing and the celebration, and he's cranky. And he says to his dad, you never gave me a young goat to celebrate with my friends. So you have three parties here. And the first party, I call it the pointless party. <laughs> this is the younger son. He goes away to a foreign country and he squanders his inheritance with riotous living. He parties for no point because there's nothing to show for it. It's not a milestone. It's not like a relationship thing. There's no friendships that follow after the fact because when he runs out of money, there's a famine in the land and he winds up joining himself to a citizen in that country who sends him into the field to feed pigs, a Jewish boy feeding pigs. Come on. That's not a party. <laughs> That's bad. So it's a pointless party, and he squanders his wealth to zero purpose. There is no value in it. And all the friends he partied with, none of them hang out for the aftermath. Anybody ever had that experience? Yeah, that's happened. Pointless parties. But then I want to talk for a moment about the pretend party. Because the pointless party, it's like it just evaporates. It's like cotton candy. When you eat cotton candy, you go to the state fair, and it's gone. In and out. Boom. Not there. But the pretend party is the older son. And this is at the end of chapter 15. And he tells his dad, Dad, you know, your son comes home, and you kill the fattened calf. We're going to get to that in a minute. But you never gave me a young goat to celebrate with my friends. And the older son is in the field, and he refuses to come into the house. He refuses to celebrate with his dad. He refuses to embrace his father's values. 
and celebrate the return of his brother. He would prefer to party and celebrate with his friends rather than embrace his father's values. That's the decision he's making. And it's interesting because he is the older son. And in this history, in this culture, tradition, the oldest son was supposed to reflect and be the father's right-hand man. He was supposed to be welcoming and including in the party and being an extension of the father's values. But instead, he chose to, he would prefer to celebrate with his friends and reject his father's values. So in his mind, he made up an imaginary party. But obviously, it never went anywhere either. So let's talk about the purposeful party. And I think this is the best part of the whole story. The purposeful party is given by the father. Yes. Yes. And if you remember what happens, the younger son, he comes to his senses in the middle of pig slop. And he says, you know, at home, all of the hirelings have enough bread to eat. And I'm out here dying from starvation. I'll go home and tell my dad I've sinned against heaven and against you. Please make me as one of the hirelings. And it says, as he went home, the father saw him from a distance. Now, I want to talk to you why this is such a significant issue. At this time in this culture, if a son said to his father, give me my inheritance, the father wasn't dead. This is as if the son would say to the father, I wish you were dead because I want your money more than I want you. Right? That's kind of disrespectful, just in like a huge way. And it wasn't only hurtful to the father, but if the community and the village where this kid lived heard about what this kid did, the whole village and community would ostracize this kid. Because he had been disrespectful. In fact, you know, Jewish law says if you dishonor your father or your mother, you should be stoned. Right? You should be killed. And so in this community, when this kid disrespected his dad, it wasn't just a slight against his dad. The whole village was like, you are anathema to us. We hate your guts. You're not welcome. If you come back around, you're not only going to get the cold shoulder. We're going to reject and exclude you because you are no longer welcome. That's how serious this was. So the fact that the kid comes to his senses and he's going to risk, he feels guilty, he feels shame, he's not accepted. He knows, not just against dad, but the whole community is going to push me away, exclude me, be hostile, critical, judgmental, condemning, and rightfully so. So when the kid makes his way home, the father sees him from a distance. And the first reaction is not, ugh. But it says he has compassion. And it says he runs to him. The kid doesn't even have to get close to the village or the community. The father bridges the gap. And the father runs, despite what the community or village would ever do, the father steps in to reconcile the kid before he ever gets a chance to be uh, rejected and exiled, excluded from the community. The father stepped in and said, I love you. The father runs to him, falls on his neck, and kisses him. Well, that in and of itself is worth a party. (laughs) Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Outrageous. And the son starts in, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The father interrupts him. Stop there. And he tells the servants. So first of all, you need to see, there's reconciliation from the father, one-on-one, with his son, who doesn't deserve it. If anything, he should have lost it altogether. So the father reconciles individually. But then the father says, put a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet, and a robe around him. And he tells it to the servants. 
Because the servants also play a part in the reconciliation. If the father goes out and does this, he's setting the tone and the tenor for everybody in the household. And he tells the servants, we're in a place and position to reconcile, not judge, not criticize, not exclude, not reject, not repel. We are going to, as a household, welcome this kid, my son. So there, we have the pretend party, and we have the pointless party, and now we have the very purposeful party. Because not only does he put a, shoes on his hands, ring on his finger, robe on him, but then he says, kill the fattened calf. Wow. All right, this is not like, you know, you kind of cut the chicken's head off and wring the chicken and you defeather it and, you know, you like have dry grilled chicken breasts. <laughs> That's not what we're doing here. This is the fattened calf. So if you've ever been around livestock and cattle, which I have not, so it's just speculative and kind of educational, you know, in a book right now for me. But my understanding is when you have a calf and you fatten up that calf, it takes time and investment. You're going to feed that calf. You're going to nurture that calf. And when you think about it, it's an investment of time, wealth, and attention and energy to make that baby super fat. And you, I don't know about you, but if you have fat on meat, it is very flavorful. <laughs> That's why chicken breasts are dry, no fat, in case you wondered. So if you have a ribeye, a ribeye steak, marbled with fat, yes and amen. I got a yeah from in, so hello, hello. And Mike, we're like, woo, bring it. You know, you can cook a ribeye to medium and it's still fantastic. Like, I like my, anyways, that's a rabbit trail. So... <laughs> Not necessary, not helpful. But it's the fattened calf is like one of the premier, if not the best livestock that they have uh, nurtured and developed and, and invested in. And we're going to sell. And here's the other piece of it. At this time in history, no chest freezers, right? No refrigerators, no ice blocks. So once you kill it, you better cook it and eat it because otherwise it's going to rot. So how are they going to eat this giant piece of meat? Lots of meat. You're going to feed the village. You're going to feed the community. You're going to throw a party. You're going to celebrate. You're going to invite all the people who are going to exclude your son, condemn and judge and be hostile and critical and repel him. You're going to invite all those people for a massive celebration with endless ribeye steaks cooked very, very well to celebrate. And they're dancing and they're having a party and there's music everywhere. There's food everywhere. Oh my goodness, this is a purposeful party. The father's saying, welcome home. And I'm not only seeing it for you and me as an individual, I'm seeing it for the household. And now I'm seeing it for the entire community that naturally would repel and reject and condemn and judge you. That's a purposeful party. Because he's telling the whole village, this is my son. I have welcomed him and embraced him and hugged him. And he is fully welcome. And if you choose to ostracize him, you're running against my values, my goal, my heart, my passion, my relationship, my reconciliation, everything with this boy. Everything. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a purposeful party. So how does that relate to us? I know, ribeyes, right? You're like, it's the ribeyes, Sarah. <laughs> that's how it relates to us. <laughs> Well, first of all, I'd say, recognize that your heavenly father says, welcome home. There's not a person in the room, not a person watching online who hasn't been a little bit of the older son or a little bit of the younger son. All of us at various times and various seasons, various combinations, I might be 80% older son and maybe 20 years ago I was 10% younger son some of us might be 90% younger son with a little smidgen of older son if there's critical hostile 
judgment, condemning. That was the older son. Your son who squandered his inheritance with riotous living. He actually uses the word prostitutes. And now you could, he comes home and you celebrate, you party. Do you hear the criticism? I have served you for all my life and I have kept all of your commandments, all of your requirements. I did it all right. He did it all wrong. Does that, does that reconcile, does that like resonate with anybody? I hope we all want to say, no, that's not me. <laughs> no, maybe. So again, let's, re- let's recognize Purposeful party, pretend party, pointless party. The father celebrates and throws a purposeful party and wants us all to celebrate. The person on your right, the person on your left, the person that doesn't look like you, the person that is less than, more than, weird, tattoos everywhere, no tattoos, suit and buttoned up, the person who doesn't have buttoned up, is ripped jeans. Come on, family. Really? Really? If the father says, welcome home, then are we embracing the father's values? Or are we choosing to be the hostile villagers that would reject and repel and exclude? The father says, welcome home. So number one, recognize that your heavenly father celebrates you. I mean, there's a good reason why we said, celebrate good times, come home, right? I mean, that's a, (laughs) you didn't even know. You were like pre-celebrating, right? (laughs) You're just planning, practicing for the real one. But number two, let's remind ourselves that we are God's son, God's daughter. And I was talking with Insul about this yesterday in my time with God in the morning. God was so deeply dealing with me on this whole reality that I am God's daughter. You are God's daughter. You are God's son. Galatians 4 verse 6, it says he sends his spirit into our hearts to cry, Abba, Father. And when you look at the dialogue between the younger son and the, and the father, the younger son says to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven. The older son never leads with the word father. He just says, look, look at everything I've done. But what the father says to him is, Technon, son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. That's an identity crisis right there. The kid is not a son. He doesn't see himself as a son. I'm a slave. I've served you. I've kept all of your commandments. That's a servant. That's not a son and a daughter. That's from the outside looking in, wishing you were a part of it and an orphan, thinking, oh, I, I'm cold out here in the snow and I don't belong. And the son and the father's saying, you belong. Change your thinking. Adjust it. Let Holy Spirit, Romans 8, 16, bear witness with your spirit that you are God's son, you are God's daughter. Let that deep work of the Holy Spirit in your soul take intrude and integrate and change, transform your thinking. I belong. I don't have to earn it. I didn't lose it. If I didn't earn it, then I can't lose it because it's already given from who the Father is. It's the Father. That's why we can celebrate. The Jews call this parable the chasing father. (laughs) So much better than the prodigal son. (laughs) I like chasing father way better than prodigal son. Emphasis is on the father and not what the kids did or didn't do. It's our father. I think it's important for us to think about, you know, in this parable, we could be the younger son. We could be the older son. And we could choose to be the father. We could choose to celebrate. We could choose to let the father's values, the father's love, the father's heart flow through us. We could choose that. And that's what I would pray for you. Because that, my friends, is the purposeful party. So as you finish today, this is just to answer on your own the very bottom question. Describe a time in your life when you felt like God celebrated you. That's on your own. It's on the back. You can fill it out. There are plenty of space. But I think it's a really important, important thing for us to think about. 
Because God does celebrate you. Our Father celebrates you as his son, as his daughter, in whom he is well pleased. So I'd like you to put your hand on your heart. I'm going to close in prayer. And Father, I just thank you. I thank you for celebrating us. I thank you for your extravagant love. <laughs> goes way beyond anything we could ever even wrap our head around. I pray, Holy Spirit, Romans 5, verse 5, that you would pour the love of the Father into our hearts. Pray, Romans 8, 16, that you would bear witness with our spirit that we're your son, we're your daughter. I pray, Galatians 4, verse 6, that we sense you, Holy Spirit, in our hearts crying, Abba, Father. Father, I pray for each of us in the room, each of us watching online, that we would be carriers of your values, of your love, of your heart, that we would reconcile, be reconciled with you and reconcile the people around us to you because of your love and your pleasure in us. Thank you, God, for your generosity and your love, faithfulness and consistency in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.